Um, so we have Carol, she's going to talk about uh, geolocation in machine learning. And Carol uh, is a person with a lot of experience. She has a lot of uh, hands-on um, training that she, uh, she delivers in different situations. And uh, she will uh, tell us more about herself and uh, let's just get started. Okay. So first I'm going to share my screen. I mean, I'm gonna play the slides. So this is what we're going to go over. We're going to go over the real-time analysis of popular Uber location using Spark machine learning, Spark structured streaming, Kafka, and MapRDB. This is what the agenda looks like. So first of all, we're just going to give a brief overview of unsupervised machine learning and clustering. Then we'll use k-means to cluster Uber locations, and then we're going to save the machine learning model. We'll give a brief overview of the Kafka API. And then we're going to use Spark structured streaming to read from a Kafka topic, enrich the messages with the machine learning model. And then we're going to write this to MapRDB JSON. Then we're going to query these continuously updated database with Spark SQL. This is what our application looks like. So we have here we have the Uber cars are publishing to a Kafka topic. Then a Spark stream, structured streaming process is reading from this Kafka topic using the saved machine learning model to enrich these messages and store this in MapRDB, where it's available for continuously querying with either Spark SQL, Apache Drill, or other dashboards. Oh, speaking of which, real quick, I'm going to show the other dashboards. Um, So this is a, a recording of the application. And what this is showing is the Uber events being the enriched events with the cluster centers being published on a dashboard. So this is using um, uh, it, Vertex, which is, a, uh, which is using WebSockets to publish this on a web browser. Uh, here, here we have the messages that are being sent. And then here we see the message is being received. So we have the final enriched message has the cluster ID and the latitude and longitude. So these red markers are the cluster centers, and then the green dots are the Uber trip locations. And so we see it, it's a heat map, so they turn red when, they're, when there's more of them. So I, I just speed this up a little bit so we see how this application works. So again, here we're getting, the, these are the messages that we're receiving, and here we're displaying them. So real quick, I wanted to open, I wanted to show a similar application. Now this is an EKG application. So what this one is doing is it's detecting anomalies in EKGs, and it's also using k-means clustering. So what it's doing is it's, this shows that the, the points that are being sent and received, and here these are the ones that are being received. What it's doing is it's determining the waves that are anomalies in an EKG. And um, so I won't go into detail about more about that one, but this one you can download the, you can read about it on the MapBar blog. I'll give the link later. And you can also download the code for that one. So I did this one with the data scientist at, Map, at MapBar. Okay, so those are the examples of using machine learning with k-means and structured streaming. Now I'll go more into the details of this application. First of all, just a brief introduction to machine learning and clustering. So this shows machine learning. What it does is it machine learning uses algorithms to find the patterns in data. And then it uses a model that recognizes those patterns to make predictions on new data. There are typically two phases in machine learning with real-time data. 
The first phase involves analysis on the historical data to build the machine learning model. The second phase uses the model in production on live events. And that's what we're going to do in this one. First, we're going to build the model. We're going to save it. And then we're going to use the deployed model on live events. So first, we're going to build the model with historic data. This just shows another um, depiction of the same process. It shows a little bit more detail that you also want to monitor your deployed model and update it. In general, machine learning may be broken down into two classes of algorithms, supervised and unsupervised. With supervised learning, you have a known outcome or label that you want your data to predict. Unsupervised, unsupervised algorithms do not have the outputs or labels in advance. And in this example, we're going to be using unsupervised learning. Supervised algorithms use labeled data in which both the input and target outcome or label are provided to the algorithms. And this is used to build the model. And then you can use the features and the model to predict a label. Unsupervised algorithms find patterns in unlabeled data. For example, grouping similar customers based on purchase data. Then they use this model with new per customer purchase data, for example, to find a similar customer group. Google News uses a technique called clustering to group news article into different categories based on the text content. Clustering algorithms discover groupings that occur in collections of data by analyzing similarities between input examples. Some machine learning examples of clustering include grouping search results, grouping similar customers, grouping similar text for categorization, grouping similar products for behavior or grouping similar products or, or behavior for recommendations, and also anomaly detection. And what anomaly detection does is it finds what's outside of the group, so what's not similar. And that's what the EKG example is doing. It was finding the anomalies. Let's go through a clustering example using a k-means algorithm. We want to create k number of clusters that group these data points with those that are most similar or closest. Clustering using the k-means algorithm begins by initializing all the coordinates to k cluster centers. With every pass of the algorithm, each point is assigned to its nearest cluster center. So here, we're for example, we're assigning all these points to the nearest cluster center. The centroids are then updated to be the centers of all the points assigned to it in that pass. And this is repeated until there's a minimum change of the cluster centers from the last iteration. And so here we see the final result, where the clusters the cluster centers are in the center of the points assigned to it. Now we'll go over clustering the Uber trip locations. First of all, just an explanation of Spark distributed data sets and data frames, because that's what we're going to be using. A data set is a distributed collection of objects spread out across multiple nodes in the cluster. A data frame is a data set of row objects. And this is like a table partitioned across a cluster. So this shows a data frame is composed of rows that are distributed across a cluster. This shows how a data set is read in from a file. So first, tasks are sent to worker nodes. And then each task reads a block of data from a distributed file and caches that as a as a partition in a data set or data frame. So next, we're going to look at reading in our Uber data into a data frame or data set. And this is what our data looks like. We have the date and time of the pickup, the latitude, the longitude, and then the base company affiliated with the Uber pickup. And it's in columns, separated format. And so here is what an example looks like, the date, the latitude, the longitude, and then the base. The first thing that we want to do is use a scalar class to define the schema corresponding to a line in the schema file. So here it corresponds to a line in the file. So here again is our format, and we specified the Uber class that corresponds to this. 
and also the schema. Then we're going to use this schema and the Uber class to read into a data set. And this is how we do it. We specify the Spark read with the, the file type, the option that we're not inferring the schema. You could infer the schema. That means that you don't have to specify this, but it's a lot faster. And in production, it's recommended that you do specify the schema. It also eliminates a lot of errors. Um, so we're not using the header. And then we're specifying the location of the file. And this is that Uber class. So this is going to lo load this into a data frame or data set. Remember that a data frame is just a data set of rows. This is what it looks like then, the results look like. So we get back from this a data set of Uber objects. If we take a couple of rows from this, it looks like an array of Uber objects. So that's this distributed collection. It consists of columns and rows. And each row is then an Uber object. So in Spark Data 2.0, the data set and, and data frame APIs were merged. So again, a data frame is just a data set of row objects. And with a data frame, you can use SQL. A data set is a collection of typed objects, and you can use SQL and functions. With the data frame or data set, you have transformations and actions. Transformations are lazily executed, and they create a new data set from the current one. So that's going to create a new data frame. And actions return a value to the driver. Spark Machine Learning provides a set of APIs built on top of data frames for machine learning workflows. In our workflow, we're going to use a transformer to transform data frame into another data frame with a features vector. Then we're going to use an estimator to train on the data frame and produce a model. In order for the features to be used by a machine learning algorithm, they need to be transformed into features vectors, which are vectors of numbers representing the value for each feature. So next, we're going to look at putting our um, features or the attributes for our machine learning model into the feature vector. So the features of the if questions are properties that you can use for your machine learning model. For our features, what we're going to do is we're going to group by latitude and longitude. So those are going to be our features with machine learning. And then after we've determined this cluster centers, we're going to use Spark SQL to analyze by the day of the week the time, and things like that for the cluster centers. And I just want to point out that this is real Uber data, but it's not real Uber code. So real Uber is actually doing things like real-time price surging, but the code I wrote here is probably much simpler, and it was written by me. So first, we're going to look at using a transformer to extract the features. And in order to do this, we use what's called a vector assembler. And what we do with our, we create the vector assembler. We specify the input columns, which is the latitude and longitude. So those are those, the latitude and longitude. Those are the input. The output column is the features column. So that's going to put these features into a feature vector that can be used for machine learning. Then we call transform on our data frame. And this returns a data frame with that features column. The next thing that we want to do is create the k-means estimator. estimator. That's what we're going to use to create the model to train. And so we create the k-means estimator. We set here the number of clusters. We set our features column, which is this. We set Here we're setting the column name for the return prediction of the cluster center. And then how many iterations we want to perform. Then we can use this estimator to train the model. So here we call k-means fit on our estimator uh, with the data frame that has this feature vector. So that's going to put in the feature vector to the estimator. It's going to fit it and return, sorry, and return the k-means model. Then from this model, we can get the cluster centers. So we call cluster centers, and we're printing those out. And this shows the cluster centers for our, our data. 
which is in Manhattan. So we see that the most Manhattan is that where the most dense cluster centers are. And that, now we can analyze this data further. This just shows a close up of this, our fitted model. So we can get the cluster centers just from the data that we trained already with the predictions clusters. And that's going to return a data frame with all the cluster IDs. Or if we want to use get cluster centers for new data, we can pass in a new data frame onto the model and that'll pass back another data frame with the cluster centers corresponding to that. Then we can create a view. So this is going to create a table and for us to use. Then we can use Spark SQL with this. So next, we'll look at some examples of analyzing this data. Here, we're, we're determining which cluster centers had the highest number of pickups. So we're grouping by the cluster ID, we're getting the count, and then we're ordering this, ordering by the count and descending and showing just the top five. So we see that the top five are six, five, and zero, 16, and then 13. So these we can see are in the Manhattan area, which makes sense. So that's where we have the most pickups. Here we are asking which clusters had the highest number of pickups. This is so the same query that we had before, but here we're using Spark SQL instead of the data frame methods. And we're displaying this in Zeppelin with the then a table. So here again, we see the same results, five, six, um, 13, and zero, 16. So those were the highest ones. Here we're asking how many pickups occurred in the busiest five clusters by hour. So we're selecting by the hour on the, from the date time and the cluster ID. We're counting the cluster ID and then we're, we're specifying that the cluster ID is in those first hour in the cluster ID. So then here we see the examples are that the cluster six and five were the busiest, especially during the hours from 15, 15 which is three o'clock till seven o'clock or even nine o'clock. This is which hours had the highest number of pickups. So again, we here have, we're grouping by the hour and here we have the most pickups in the rush hour from about with five o'clock the highest. Next, what we're going to do is we're saving this to the distributed file system so that we can use this later with, with the streaming data. This shows what it looks like on the, on the file system. So here we're just listing the results. What it consists of is metadata, which is in JSON format, and also then data, which is in Parquet format. So now I just want to show a Zeppelin notebook real quick with that, what we just went over. And then we'll go back to the slides for the, then we'll go back to the slides for the rest of it. Uh oh. Um, I guess I won't be able to, I guess I won't be able to show the, the Zeppelin notebook. I'll try it one more time. Okay. I guess I won't be able to show the Zeppelin notebook. I'm sorry about that. I'll just, um, well, it's, it's mostly, it's in the slides anyway. I just wanted to show it, but um, I'm having problems sharing that part. So here I'll just share. It's letting me share Word instead of PowerPoint. That's weird. Uh, Carol, meanwhile, we, we have a question. Do you think it's a good time to answer it meanwhile or wait for the end? Uh, I, can, I can answer a question real quick. Um, did you, what did you see when I shared the Word? I don't even have Word running. 
I think uh, what I saw was this uh, a recurs recursive view of the screen. It was um, basically a tangle within itself. You want to try again? Um. Well, I just, yeah, yeah, I just, I'll try it one more time. Okay. Uh, there was a question about uh, who um, who would write the algorithm, uh, like the, the K-means algorithm. Is it a, a machine learning engineer or a data scientist? If you have two of these people in the same uh, team, I am not so, uh, oh, it's, this is happening again. I, I am not so clear myself if there is a good definition of what is a machine learning engineer versus a data scientist. And I think it's sort of, a vague demarcation, um, um, but you yeah, may have experience in it. But now the distinction usually is between a data engineer and a data scientist. So, and I would say like the data scientist is the one that, that knows more about the the machine learning and things like that. And then the data engineer is the one that's responsible more for the preparation of the data, making, you know, putting all the, the extract, transform into production. And I think then the, they need to work together to get the machine learning model into production. And then the data scientist also works with the business people to understand the problems and understand how to, the data and how to extract the most information out of it. I think it's good for also for, for developers and data engineers to under, also understand machine learning um, because it's also becoming more accessible for other people to use, and the, but the data scientists are more spe specific in the knowing the, the details of the machine learning, I would say. Another question uh, is, uh, how much horsepower do you actually need to run a help server and get a decent response time? Well, that depends on the, data, the amount of data. The, basically, the cluster should scale as the amount of data that you have. So you again, your data is partitioned across this cluster. So it really depends on how much data you have. Also, you know, in Spark, it's the data is partitioned when it's stored across the cluster, but in memory, it's going to be also being in memory when it's being processed by Spark. So the amount of memory you need depends on how much data you're processing. But um, you can like, you can have one node cluster if you don't have very much data. Um, so I, I guess I'll just keep going without the Spark notebooks. Uh, most of the info, all the information's in the slide anyway. I just, I just wanted to show what it looks like in the notebook. Next, we're gonna look at the Kafka API and, and the streaming data. So this is this part of the application where we're receiving the events and we're rapidly storing those and making them available. First of all, what is a stream? So a stream is a con and it's an unbounded sequence of events that go from the producers to consumers. And with Kafka, it consists of key values. This is just some examples of streaming data that there's a lot of all kinds of examples of streaming data now that it's being becoming more and more important to process this data with machine learning. Here's an example of the EKG, an example of EKG data from the technology review. So a Stanford team has shown that a machine learning model can identify arrhythmias from an EKG better than an expert. Even now there's on the Apple iWatch, they have an EKG. So, and then this is that example that I showed you in the beginning that I worked on with a data scientist where we, and you, this is so the blog that where you can read about this and download the code. And the slides for this will be also be made available. I have slides, I'll be made available on SlideShare. So going back to what Kafka is, Kafka uses topics and these topics are their logical collections of messages which organize the events into categories and also decouple the producers from the consumers. Topics are partitioned for throughput and scalability. The partitions make the topic scalable by spreading the load for topic across multiple servers. You can think of a partition like an event log or a queue 
new messages are added to the end. Also like a queue, events are delivered in the order they are received. And you, the consumers can use read cursors to read this. However, unlike a queue, messages are not deleted when read. They remain on the partition available to other consumers. I'm not sure if uh, you were advancing slides. We are still in the heading slide. Oh, you are? Oh, no. Yeah, I was advancing slides. The sharing isn't working very well then. Oh, this isn't working at all. Um, so now do you see it? Yes, now they're moving along. Uh, what's work wasn't working was the um oh well, okay. I'll just do it this way then. Sorry. Let me try it one more time. Oh, that doesn't work. Okay. Sorry. Okay, I'll just go. Uh, Okay, sorry. Well, I'll just show you the slides real quick that we, so you didn't see any of those? You didn't see any of those slides? We have not. Huh? No. Okay, so then I'll just show the slides real quick. This is what the stream is. I don't, I won't go over the, sorry. This is what the stream is, examples of streaming data. Um, this is a specific example of EKG that was in the news. EKG was streaming data. So that's an example of machine learning and streaming data that was in the news. Um, then, so here, this is how Kafka organizes the data into topics. And the topics are then partitioned across a cluster for throughput and scalability. And this is showing the partitions. The partitions are like a queue, and the messages are added to the end. And then this messages are delivered in the order that they're received like a queue. But unlike a queue, the events are still persisted after they're delivered. So they remain on the queue. And this is useful for two reasons. So messages can be persisted forever or they can be deleted automatically. So it's useful to keep the messages on the queue for two reasons. It makes it faster because it minimizes the disk reads and writes. And also not deleting the messages when they're read means that the same message can be processed for different purposes. For example, if you want to have different views of the same message. So this is, can be very useful. So now going into Spark structured streaming. So now what we're going to look at is processing the data with Spark structured streaming. So we're going to get the structure, the data. We're going to enrich it with a machine learning model and then save it to MapRDB. And then we'll be able to query it rapidly. So this is what happens when the data with Spark streaming. The data is read from the stream this time by the task and then cached into the partitions. Structured streaming is a scalable stream processing engine built on top of the Spark SQL engine. It enables you to view data published to Kafka as an unbounded data frame and process this data of the same data frame and SQL APIs used for batch processing. And the stream is continuously processed. For example, here we have a query that is selecting the count and the sum of the amount from the counts and grouping by the count ID. And here we have accounts with coming in with the either deposits or debits. So the positive would be a deposit. And here we're then what's being saved by this query is just the sum of this amount. And so you see that what is it's continuously processed and the result is the is the result of this continuously processed query. But the stream has all of the information in it. And Spark is automatically streamifying these SQL plans. So it's automatically incrementally 
creating a query plan and processing that for the amount of data that came in for the de delta. So this processing events, it's useful for things like ETL, filtering, transforming, enriching with the machine learning, which is what we're going to do, and then writing these results to files, databases, or to a different topic in a pipeline. And this is what we're going to do next. We're going to look at the getting this data, extracting the features, using the model, and then getting providing these pred predictions of the cluster centers. So that, again, is this part of the, our example. The first thing that we want to do is we're going to load the saved model. We use that k-means model. To, this is a static class, load method. And we specify the path on the from the distributed file system. And this is going to return the model that we can use. Next, the next thing that we want to do is start reading from the Kafka topic. And this is how we read from a stream with Spark. So we specify read stream this time instead before it was a Spark read when we were specifying from the file. And the format is Kafka. And then the different options for Kafka. So this is, we're specifying the topic here, where we want to start. We want to start from the earliest, um, how, many, how many messages we want to get at a time. And then we specify load. And this returns a data frame that looks like this. So it's, again, Kafka has keys values. So these are binary values right now. The key values are in binary format. Then it also returns the topic name, the partition number, the offset and a timestamp. So what we want to do is we want to then turn this binary values, the value, into a string of Uber objects like we, what we had before when we're reading it in from a file. This it just shows that schema of the Kafka data frame. So what we're going to use, again, we're specifying this case class for Uber. And now we're also specifying a, a function to parse a string. In class. Just receiving a string. It's splitting it by the comma. And then creating an Uber class from this, the string tokens. Then we're going to use this. Again, this parse uber function, we're going to use that in a UDF, which is a user defined function. So we're registering that parse uber uh, with, the met, with the UDF called deserialize, which is going to in, receive a string and return uber objects by parsing these uber strings. So then we're going to use this UDF with that data frame that we had before. So we're here we're taking the data frame that has this value co column. We're casting that to a string, and then we're using the UDF to deserialize it. And this is going to return then Uber objects. So now we have a data frame of Uber objects. And the thing that we next thing that we want to do with these Uber objects is extract the features from those so that we can get the cluster centers. So to extract the features, what we're going to use again is a vector assembler. Like we did before, we specify the feature columns of the latitude and longitude and the output is a features. So that then we call transform on that data frame that we have of Uber, Uber objects. And this is going to return a data frame with the features vector. Then we can use that data frame to get the cluster centers with the model. So the next thing that we do is we use the model that we read in. We call transform on that data frame. And that's going to return the model. I mean, sorry, a data frame with the cluster IDs. So that's what this data frame looks like now. So it has then the cluster IDs in a column. The column is actually called um, CID1 because that's what we set it to. Uh, we called it. Anyway, that's what we set it to in the model. So this column is going to be called, that has a col column IDs is called CID1. Then we're here we're doing a little bit of extra stuff because we want to save it to MapRDB. What we need to do is create a unique ID, row key, which is called the ID. So we have to create a unique row ID for this each row. So we're creating a new unique ID from the uh, 
um, where is, oh yes, here. So with the collop, what we're creating, the ID is we're concatenating the cluster ID with the reverse time step. So we, cre we create a reverse time step, and that's gonna be the, the cluster ID. And so now our new data frame looks like this. It has an, a unique ID and then the, the date time, the latitude, the longitude, the cluster ID, and then we've also added the latitude, latitude and longitude for the cluster ID. So that's, that's what we're gonna be saving into MapRDB. First, we can show, we can write to memory just to do some test queries in memory. This is not recommended to do in production for, because you'll run out of memory, but you can do this for just a little bit of memory to see how, it, to, for a little bit of analysis. So this is how you do this. We're writing to a memory sync. So here we specify the output mode of append and the format is memory. And then we start the query and then we can see what's inside of this. Oops. So here we're just doing a select all. So that shows what our data frame looks like. That we now have, this is our enriched data frame with the cluster ID and the latitude and longitude and also an unique ID. Here's a query on our streaming data. So here we're selecting the hour and the cluster ID and getting a count of the cluster ID. So it's showing that the count by cluster ID for hour. And here we see, um, so again, five o'clock is about when you have the most for these clusters, the blue cluster, zero has the most. So next what we wanna do is we wanna save this to MapRDB to make it available for more important queries and also available then querying for the um, applications or just analysis. So we're gonna be looking at this part of the processing pipeline using the MapRDB Spark connector. And this MapRDB Spark connector, it has a connection object in each executor so that, that this is gonna be running with the task in parallel on the partition, partition data. Um, I'll skip that slide. MapRDB is designed for partitioning and scaling. It provides fast reads and writes by row key because the data is automatically partitioned by key range. But this is going to provide fast reads and writes by key range. So each server is, provi is work providing a partition of the table. So we see that the table is partitioned across servers. In this case, our key is the ID is composed of the cluster ID plus a reverse timestamp. So it's automatically going to be partitioned and sorted by this ID and row key, this row key. So it's going to be sorted by the cluster ID and the reverse timestamp, which is going to mean the most recent are going to be first. Then to write this to the MapRDB sync, we specified that we write the stream. We specify the table name, the row key, and some other options, and then we start the query. And this is then going to be writing, so this, from the this partitions, the streams are in partitions, and the tables are in partitions. So all this is going to be in parallel. So it's read into a data, data frame in partitions and then written in partitions so that it'll be really fast. Next, looking at exploring this data with Spark SQL, again, using the Spark SQL connector, which you can query MapRDB JSON or files. Here we're specifying with Spark, we're loading from MapRDB, we specify the table name, the schema, and then this class. And what this is going to do then, is going to load from the table partitions each task into memory caches. And this shows now what our data frame looks like after we've loaded it. We have, so the data is automatically partitioned and sorted by the row key. So here we see it's partitioned with the, and sorted, so zero is first and the most recent first. We create a table, a temporary view of the table so that we can also use SQL with this. And then we can perform some analysis. So for example, the top five cluster trip counts, we group, group by the cluster ID, we count, we order, and then we show. 
which we see that 650, 16, and 13 are the have the highest number of trips, which again correspond to this. And this one, this map, what we're showing is here are the cluster centers, and then these are the points that we're displaying on the map again. This is done in the Zeppelin notebook, if I could show that. Here we're just dis we're displaying the latest location. So this is again going to be continuously updated if we're structured streaming this into MapRDB. So this is going to be continuously displaying the most recent. Here's an example of which hours have the highest pickups for cluster ID zero. So we're filtering first by the row key is less than or equal to one. So that would be zero, because again, the row key has the cluster ID in it. Then we're selecting the hour and the cluster ID, and we're grouping by the hour and the cluster ID, and then we're getting the count. So that is for cluster ID zero, the highest numbers. This shows if you do explain on your queries, then you get the, the query plan for this. And here what it shows is that this project the filter, so the projection is the selecting of the hour and the alias. And then the filtering is, we're filtering on the row key. So this projection and filtering is getting pushed down into MapRDB. And what this means is that it's going to give you a better performance because it's going to be returning less data. So this is the selection and filtering is pushed down into MapRDB. So that's going to be happening in MapRDB. So it's returning less data to the Spark engine. So it'll give you better performance. So that's important, actually. If you don't need all the data, then you should specify that you don't want all the data. Here for, here's a query for which hours and clusters have the highest pickups. So here we're selecting the hour, the cluster ID, and then we're grouping by the hour and the cluster ID. And we see um, the red and the green have the highest number, which is five and six in the rush hour. So all that you can read about this and all the code is available in this new ebook from MapR, which is free. You can download it here. And there's also other examples in this new ebook. We also have other free e MapR ebooks. Um, and it's these are all available for download at mapr.com slash ebooks. We also have a Spark 2.0 training at learn.mapr.com. We also have a Spark 2.0 cert certification. The training is also free. We also have a lot of blogs about Spark and other things on the MapR blog. And everything I talk about can run on the MapR data platform, which you can also, you can download different versions like to run on a sandbox or you can run it in the cloud. So you can, you can download that to try that out also. And so again, I'll make these, these slides available on SlideShare. And now I'm, um, I'm ready for any questions. Um, so are there any questions, Eyal? I don't see any new question at the moment. We can maybe discuss a little bit more about uh, different uh, roles. Um, it looks like the person who asked about a machine learning learning engineer versus data scientist, he said that it looks like the reason for the question is that he's looking, he's beginning with the, he wants to get enter the the the, the field, and he's looking for what um, what classes to take or what um, I'm not sure what it's called a, a path. So I'll, I'll just read what he said in Coursera, EDX, Audacity, et cetera. We have a ton of course, courses on both machine learning and data science. So wondering which one to start. It looks like he decided to start with data science. But if you have any input about how to choose the path, how to choose classes, or if you learn on your own how to choose the materials that you want to get started with, how, um, how to decide what uh, in which direction to go based maybe on, on current experience or interests or what it is that you're going to do at the end. I think the question itself was, the original question was, uh, who is actually writing the algorithm perhaps versus who is just using the algorithm, but maybe there is more 
there is more to say here. Well, um, for getting started, that's true. There's there's a whole lot of there's a whole lot of examples now on Coursera, EDX, Udacity, also on O'Reilly. There's a lot. Um, so what I do, I just try out I try out different ones and stick with the ones that I like the best. So I've I don't personally I like a lot of them on Coursera. Um, then there's also like if you want to learn more about Spark, then again we have the Spark on our at MapArt. Dot com we have an online class that, where you can specifically learn about spark and um yeah i would just think that it depends on your preference which one you like better then there's you know it also maybe depends on what you want to do with it if you're more like a a dev, if you want to go more the developer type or data engineer type or really get into the the more the the data science part of it then you know that might depend on which type of class you like too. There's a whole lot of, and there's blogs and too. There's even like, um, there's also lists of blogs and stuff that you can use. I know there, there's some really good websites like Data Science Central, and there's a, there's a lot, really a lot. <laughs> so there is another uh, question about the real time um, characteristic. What technical challenges one may face with uh, real time data processing? Well, one is, you know, the speed of the data. So how that's how much data is coming in and can you can you store and process it fast enough? And that's where something like Kafka and Spark Streaming helps that you you want to be able to process this quickly. Um, so you want to be able to process it. And typically what I said is actually you don't actually perform the machine. Usually you don't perform the machine learning on the on the streaming data, usually you, you you want to look at historical data, perform the machine learning there, and then you're going to use that model with the live data. There are some like algorithms that can learn on live data, but typically you, you need to like analyze historical data to be able to use the live data for like to use the live data. Okay, I, I don't see any other questions. If anybody still has a question, please uh, type it in now. Would you like to maybe tell us a little bit about what you do um, in your job? What you've done before, possibly as well? Uh, so I have, a, I have a developer background. I worked in um, different areas as a job. I was a Java developer. I worked in on banking and banking loans and then also in telecom and in health insurance i worked on a health insurance exchange and then i i switched over to big data with mapr so i went i was using java enterprise edition a lot before that then i switched over to big data and i started out looking at hbase and then then mapr um then i'm sorry apache drill which is a sql another sql engine for analyzing data big data um then i started looking into apache spark in detail and and then typically what i do is i write prototypes and work, work with other people at mapr and then write a lot of tutorials about that uh, i see something else came up here give me a second it says, as a Kafka topic is spread across multiple partitions, is it guaranteed the client would get the messages in the correct order? If not, how to handle them correctly? That's a good question. So the, the topics, the partitions are in order. So the partitions are going to be in the order that they were received. So each partition is in, in order. So if you, if it's important that you want to receive those messages in order, then you would read from that specific partition to get them in order. If you're reading from multiple partitions, then the order is going to be is going to be, you know, not not in order. But anyway, so for each partition it's in order. Also the, the offsets are in the order that they're received for that partition. So the offset is the ID of the message.
but it's, if it's also another thing about that is if it's really important that you have, know which order your messages are in, then also the producer should be giving its own ID for the for the order of the events. And then you can always know the order of the events on the consumer side too. Another question says, what level of accuracy do you have, have you achieved with overclustering? With what? With, I guess with this example of overclustering, uh, what level of accuracy have you achieved? Um, well, the, the, so if you're measure, measuring the, the mean square error, I don't remember exactly what it was. So, um, I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but the evaluation of accuracy for clustering is is different than it would be for like a supervised machine learning task because with supervised machine learning, you're evaluating the accuracy based on la la labels. And with unsupervised learning, you don't have labels. So then it's a different way of evaluating the accuracy. Typically what you wanna do is analyze the, the cluster. You need also to a human to analyze the clusters to see what type of more analysis about the, the results of the grouping. And somebody is asking when will the slides be available on the on SlideShare? So uh, we just sent the, the, the link for the uh, SlideShare in the chat of the YouTube. I can put it later also in the in the actual comments of the video and the comments of the meetup. So uh, Carol, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. And uh, we hope, I hope to, <laughs> yes, we all hope to see you back uh, presenting in the future. Um, Hands-on presentations, I, I think, are very important for what we do. Uh, it's beyond uh, just reading about algorithms and um, how we could use them, but we see here uh, how they are being used. Uh, so um, thank you for everybody that joined us. And... Uh, all of you that uh, were not able to join us um, in real time, hopefully you're watching it later on. And uh, we hope to see you back in the March meeting that we will announce soon. Thank you very much. Goodbye.